Thanks very much, and it's really a pleasure to be here in the Dodson Room of the University of British Columbia Irving K. Barber Learning Center and the Library. And here on Thursday afternoon, on November the 27th, it's really a thrill as well to, to have Terry Watata flying in from Toronto this morning to be with us and, and Jim Wong Chu. And uh, just about an hour ago over lunch, we were talking about then um, different approaches to archives and how both of you in many years of activism have been involved with not only uh, community work, but in um, both uh, donating materials to archives and contributing to the, the longer community memory of important literary and cultural events and um, also chronicling your, your own participation in, in those events as well too. And so I, I wanted to start off by discussing the uh, importance of archives in your work and the, the types of, of challenges that you found in compiling these special collections that arise out of your own collecting, uh, but also in your attempts to locate other materials that can be contributed to, to archives. And uh, so this is a question about then um, partly the logistics of getting material together and then also partly then about your, um, your, your personal experiences in, in working with different kinds of archival materials. So I, I guess I'll, I'll start with, with, with Terry and then uh, move on to, to Jim. Thank you, Glenn. <clears throat> well, um, I could start by saying that my mother was a pack rat. And uh, maybe that's why I inherited that particular trait. When she passed away, we had to, well, I had to clean out all of her stuff and I hired people to take it away, and it turned out that she had two tons of material, all kinds of stuff. And uh, I, I, would, I thought to myself, I'll, I'll, ne I'll never get to that point. As it turned out, <laughs> when I uh, when actually it was the University of Guelph uh, approached me because I had been a theater producer, uh, Asian Canadian theater, in fact, specifically, and also uh, a playwright as well, but uh, they were particular inter particularly interested in my uh, production days. And so I had all this material, which, for want of a better word, because I'm a pack rat, I had posters, programs, uh, director's notes, acting notes, all kinds of stuff down in the basement, and so I gave that to them. And that sort of kicked it off because three, five years later, I think it was, the uh, East Asian Library at the University of Toronto through Roland Coloma, a professor at OISE, approached me and said, well, you must have other material other than your you know, play production. I said, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. Uh, why don't you donate it? And at, it came to me, well, yeah, well, why don't I do, do that? I don't want to throw it away. And I, certainly my uh, son won't uh, care. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so I put together, started collecting stuff. And I, fortunately, they were in proper files. Now, I did that initially just to keep track of what I did over the years because I was constantly being asked to show up at this, play music, read your poetry, read whatever, all kinds of stuff, participate in panels like this. And... After a while, you just lose it. <laughs> what did I do in 1982? I don't know. And so that's why I started compiling these or collecting these files in my basement. And then um, my family started complaining about that <laughs> because it was just filled with stuff. And so I started putting it all together, and I came up with about 90 boxes, cardboard boxes of material which the East Asian Library was uh, very happy to receive because they, the uh, Asian Canadian Studies uh, was starting to happen at the U of T. Um, 
at the U of T, period. And uh, so they were very happy to receive this material, which included manuscripts, books, a lot of books, magazines, Asian, Asian Canadian as well as Asian American magazines. For some reason, I had a huge collection. I don't know why. It just happens, I guess. Posters, uh, programs, all kinds of material, and so I sent it over there. And about a month later, they contacted me and said they, they, they cannot take care of my personal manuscripts for my creative work. And so they said they sent it over to the Rare Books Library, and they housed it there, which was quite something to me because they, they invited me to come into their stacks. And they said, well, we have, you know, this is, this is part of the collection. We have... I think they said five warehouses around the city with all the other stuff. So you'll be here between Margaret Atwood and Carol Shields or something like that. <laughs> really? Wow. Am I part of the canon? I can't believe this. But they saw great value in it, fortunately for me, and so I was only happy to give it to them. Now, the problem is I didn't give them everything because I still have ongoing work. I'm not dead yet, as, uh, <laughs> as they say. And so more and more material is being uh, collected as, as we speak. And again, fortunately, the library is very happy, will be very happy to accept it in the future. Does that answer your question? Okay, Jim. Um, yeah, I'm very particular about memory. And sometimes when somebody sends me a letter, in those days people actually write letters, and sometimes you don't know if you're going to see them again. Sometimes that's all you got. So for me, I always packed it around. I used to have a suitcase full of just, let's say, stuff, you know, personal stuff that, you know, that I think were meaningful to me. And um, as um, I start working more into the... Um, Asian community, and I was more involved with uh, people, meetings, and different things, you have to keep track of things. And um, you had a meeting, sometimes you have to go and refer back to it, so you start keeping things. And um, you know, there are events, and people invite me to events. Sometimes there's a catalog or a pamphlet. And you look at it and say, well, you know, it's worth something. At least it was worth something to me. So I just kind of threw it in a pile and just kept it. And you know, after a while, you kind of throw it into another pile and into a box. And stuff just accumulated that way. And um, you, you just get into a habit of doing that because at some point it might be important. And I, I mean, I never thought that, you know, it would get to a stage where it actually would go, go into, a, you know, a, a collection, you know, that, that people would be able to, you know, come back and take a look at it. But um, I always thought that, you know, because it was kind of, it came also from this experience of seeing how much stuff was thrown out um, and things that you saw that shouldn't have been thrown out, but it's, it's actually disappeared, that you know, sometimes you regret. I mean, uh, when one of the old associations was renovating, they actually had a whole um, dumpster out, out in front there. And we just... You know, friends and artists, we went in there and just just went through as much as we could to pull out, uh, you know, because as far as they're concerned, it's junk. But, you know, like it was their um, annual reports or, you know, some magazines that they'd done and so on. But, you know, so much of that gets lost and, you know, that we don't take value of. And um, it's it's a lot of that kind of stuff that really kind of builds the experience of it. And also there was one time... I met a person named Charles Louis, and he was the manager of a Chinese Canadian soccer team in, back in 19, between 1990 to about, uh, about until almost the war, when most of the Chinese got conscripted. And he was the, he was the, the manager of the team for quite a, quite a few years. And he showed me the scrapbook that was absolutely amazing. I mean, it's every little bit of write-ups, newspaper clippings, everything in that one book. I mean, it was an incredible amount of memory, except that you know, his, his wife didn't like what he was doing. So after he passed away, that scrapbook disappeared. Nobody knows where it is. So I mean, it's like that. 
Also right now, I'm in pursuit of another person, which I don't know if I can do it myself. But there's a person, um, um, let's see if I can, I don't know if I can even remember his name. Oh, it's Patty, Patty Wing. And Patty was a, um, he's a, a tap dancer. And he loved to tap dance. So what he did was that he, um, he got a couple of, um, you know, vaudeville people that were here because he lived close to Chinatown. Chinatown was close to the Hogan Alley. And so he got a couple of black performers to teach him how to tap dance, and he got really good at it. And so there was a contest, and the next thing you know, um, he won the contest, and the prize was that he gets to go to New York and do a performance there. And, you know, once he got there, he never came back, really, because he got hooked up with the, um, what we call a chop suit circuit at that time. There was a, an, uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, vaudeville Chinese uh, American, Chinese, Canadian, Broadville performers. And there was a lot of clubs, and some of them were Chinese-owned. So there was a circuit, we call it Chop Su Circuit. And so he, uh, he hooked up with this uh, group of women called the China Doll Review, and he would choreography, and he would you know, do, do the stuff, and, and they would tour. And to you know, cut the story short is that I talked to him quite a while back, and he also has a scrapbook, an amazing scrapbook. And it's like a lot of history that nobody even knows about. You know, it's, it's this, this kind of treasure trove of stuff. And recently, you know, he was still, he's still alive, and he recently had been uh, gone into a, a, uh, a care home. But he's still fairly lucid. And so I know that time is quite short, and I don't know if I'm the person that needs to interview him, but we need to get to him. And fortunately, uh, I had the photo exhibition, and uh, two of the sisters, of his sisters, came. So at least I have a connection, and I want very much to save that scrapbook. So, but anyways, am I getting too long? <laughs> I just uh, wanted to say that in the collecting of things, for example, posters, like the, I don't know if you've heard of the Kearney Street Workshop down in San Francisco, they produced cheap, not cheap, but posters for every event in the Japanese American, Chinese American, the Asian Canadian community, Asian American communities in the Bay Area. And after a while, when you collect these posters, you notice that there's a consistency of style. And you could make the argument that it is an Asian American style that has grown out of this. And for some reason, it influenced the New York community as well. Their posters are very similar to those posters. And if you look at the Powell Street Festival right here in Vancouver, you notice that there is a consistency of style to a certain point, and then it evolves, I would say. And I think that's important, you know, to make an argument about Asian Canadian community, Asian Canadian movements, Asian Canadian genres that there is this consistency of style, and it comes from us. Thank you for taking us as, as well to the conjoining of, of different communities, because I think that here we uh, have a, a great opportunity to go back down memory lane to the intersection of pathways between Terry and Jim and you had mentioned earlier that you think that it was Powell Street as the event that really saw your, your meeting it, sometime around 1977, perhaps. So I, I would like you both to then take us back to that particular period of the incubation of an early kind of Asian-Canadian activist energy, one manifestation of it anyways, and to talk about your sense of then an Asian Canadian emerging consensus or style at that time, or, or what you were both thinking about and working on at that particular time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I think my, um, I guess, introduction to uh, activism, I guess, started in 1970 when uh, just before that I was in a group called the Asia Miners. We were a top 40 uh, Asian Canadian rock band in Toronto's Chinatown and into all over the city. And in 1969, 1970, it broke up. 
It was the, that was it. The, the Beatles were dead and so, so were we. And I, I, I love playing music, so I, I had to do something. So at the time, there was the rise of the singer-songwriter. And so I started, well, I should play original music because the Asian miners did not play original music. And uh, I started writing songs. And so the first, well, the, the first rule of songwriting is, you know, write what you know. And so, but what did I know? I didn't know anything about my background. I, I thought, you know, I thought we were from Japan and we flew right to Toronto and that was it. But there was this whole thing about Vancouver and the war I had no idea about. And so that's when I started asking my parents. Actually, the first question I asked my mother was, how did you meet dad? Where did you fall in love? And she called me a baka, which means idiot in Japanese. And you don't need to know that kind of stuff. But eventually, they started talking about it. And they were actually uh, married, married through an arrangement, which shocked the hell out of me. Anyway, uh, I wrote the song New Denver in 1970, which was about the internment camps and my parents' experience with those camps. And it got, the lyrics got published in the New Canadian, which is still going at that time from the war on. And... Out of that, uh, the I guess the editor of the New Canadian, or was he assistant editor, I can't remember which, he formed a group, a so-called rap group, and I don't mean in terms of music. Rap meaning that everybody gets together and starts talking about issues. And that's, uh, Alan Hutta was, started that, and we started talking about things like racism, identity, uh, the Second World War, the internment, everything. And out of that came this whole thing about the 1972 Asian-Canadian Experience Conference, which was the first Asian-Canadian uh, conference in, well, in Canada. And it was held in Toronto. And we brought people from Vancouver to Toronto, and that's where I met all the people that I know. Well, not all the people, but most of the people I had met uh, in Vancouver, and they came down, and we we found a commonality, a commonality, and we grew out of that. And I started singing my original songs. Unfortunately, they they liked it, and eventually, 1977 comes along, and the same group um, put on the Powell Street Festival, the very first one, and that's how I. I guess I, I, we were talking about this before. We uh, met through Sean Gunn and Garrick Chu, and uh, who were very prominent members of the uh, Vancouver group as well. And um, I think that's how it all came together. You know, talking about things, experiencing things, finding that everybody had the same experience in one way or another. It doesn't matter if you're Japanese, Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, there was something the same about everything. And so we found their linkages there. Yeah, my beginnings go kind of far back, but it, um, I've been kind of shoved around in different places since I was, I think, three years old. And I think on an average, I spent three years in different localities, and I was... I was in Canada, and then next thing I know, I was in Hong Kong for three years, came back, ended up in Chicago, ended up in Merritt, ended up in Prince George, and so on. So I had a very kind of disjointed kind of life. And um, also, I, um, my family wasn't with me. I came as a paper child, and that means my aunt brought me over. And uh, that really kind of screws up your identity because... At some point when she and I wasn't getting along, she finally just, I guess, you know, the final blow to kind of hurt me was to say, I'm not your son. And so what does that mean, right? So, I mean, that's why they sent me back to Hong Kong. And, but, you know, for me, it's like, I, I, I don't know what's real anymore. So during the 60s, I came down to Chinatown. And, and for the first time, you know, outside, because I, was, I came up from, from Prince George all the way down to Chinatown. And at that point of time, um, it was, I realized that this was a place that I felt comfortable with. 
nobody was judgmental. I was just part of everybody. And there was something that kind of settles you in, but yet it didn't answer all the questions. I mean, you kind of worked your way through these questions. I think everybody, you know, and, and, and something that we were talking about just recently was this idea that we went through this whole, you know, whole um, thing about identity. And at some point, we kind of made peace with it. We understood, uh, and you know, we grew out of it, and so on. Yet, what we haven't done is that we haven't left. We haven't, you know, put the legacy back. So all these new generations of people are coming through are undergoing the same problem of this identity without actually understanding what it's all about. And we're we're not there to teach them. So I think I, I realize it's incumbent for us to actually to talk about, you know, what happened in our experience. Uh, what we went through, what was the spark, why, why do we behave the way we are, you know, what, you know, what makes us the way we are, and so on. But, um, I, I mean, I was a, quite a, in the 60s, I was a, in my early 20s, and I was a very angry, very bitter, um, you know, self-loathing kind of person, not very likable. But um, it was during that period that uh, I think we were talking about uh, Tanaka, is it Ron Tanaka? Ron Tanaka, uh, he somehow ended up in Uni University of British Columbia, and he was teaching, I think, English with a whole group of uh, uh, people that we know now know about, like Paul Yi, um, uh, I think Sky Lee, and, and many of the people that, uh, you know, Sean, um, you know, there's a whole group of, a, a whole generation of people that, and he, he was affect, you know, affected by what was happening in Asia America, and he came up from California to teach. So he brought a lot of that kind of uh, verbose, but also a sense of, that you guys need to know about yourself. And the um, first time I realized that was when they came down to Chinatown and put together an exhibition of, uh, of Chinese Canadian history, an actual you know, boards with information and so on. That was quite curious to me. And, but at the same time, um, I um, took a job at the BC Ferries, and the job uh, allowed me to, to work for two weeks and get two weeks off. So I had two weeks uh, free every, every month. So uh, I spent that time, I, just, I met some friends in San Francisco, so I, every two weeks I was in San Francisco. And I saw something that was unique to me at that point, because you know, at that time I was quite selfish, and. You know, I was just more worried, you know, more concerned about myself. And I realized that these people were donating their time. They were volunteering. And, and they were having events where they would just sit at the table and give information or, or uh, work with older people or whatever, you know, work with the community. And that was so new to me, that people would donate their time freely to do something. So when I came back to Vancouver, that was some of the things I brought up for argument. You know, we would talk about it. You know, a group of our friends uh, would you know, sit in, in the Chinese you know, cafes in Chinatown, and we kept talking. And, you know, we're belly aching. What if? What if? Why, you know, why are the things the way they are? You know, and then you ask, well, what if we can change it? And then what if it's up to you then? Because it becomes why not? So somehow you have to take responsibility. You can't just belly, you can't just talk about it. you have to do something. And so that's where my activism began. That's great. I have an opportunity here, though, to ask specifically about the connections between Vancouver and Toronto, because, of course, we have you as wonderful representatives of cultural activism in both major urban centers. Both cities have distinctive claims to cultural status. They're, they're centers of publishing and artistic activity in this country. And it's interesting, I think, to, then to speculate about some of the similarities and, and, and differences. Um, certainly, Jim, you referred then to the proximity, in a sense, to San Francisco and the cultural influences of the West Coast. Um, but we've seen major Asian Canadian writers at some point in their professional lives, like Joy Kagawa or even Wei Sun Choi, spend a considerable amount of time in Toronto. So I, I thought I'd ask then about then some of the uh, some of the linkages between this West Coast 
city, Vancouver, and its Asian Canadian cultural um, activity, and, and, and Toronto, and, and what, what is distinctive about then the kind of Asian Canadian energies that we see in these cities, and about the possibilities of, and what has happened in the past, but also you know, possibilities for uh, thinking about the connections between these two cities as seemingly distant as, as, as they are. Terry. Okay, I think it uh, again goes back to Professor Ron Tanaka because he influenced so many people. One of them in particular was Alan Hotta, who was a uh, sociology major at the University of Toronto, and he graduated and couldn't find a job. But that being said, that having said that, he was really influenced by Tanaka and agreed with what a lot of the things he was talking about at that time. And of course, Tanaka was influenced by the uh, Asian American movement down in California. So it sort of came up like that. And then Al brought it to Toronto and started this whole thing, as I said before, about talking about these issues, bringing them to the forefront because people really hadn't talked about it before. Back in the early 70s, uh, Asians were still referred to as Oriental. And I think uh, Alan and Ron and Guys like Jim, Sean, Gary, all the others started using the term Asian Canadian, which was revolutionary. It's just amazing uh, what that does, and it links Toronto and Vancouver that way in mindset. Then, of course, when we brought all those people from Vancouver to Toronto, they actually brought the very first photographs of the internment and put them on a wall for the conference. And it was just mind-blowing. I had never seen those photographs. No one really had. Uh, they were stuck in the archives somewhere, UBC archives or in Ottawa's archives. And they, they, gave, they brought them out into the light. And so there was another connection there. And yes, you say there's a lot of uh, influence from the Bay Area and Los Angeles up into uh, the Vancouver area. Toronto also had a lot of influence from New York because right there was one of the most important uh, activists in the Asian American and African American uh, movements, uh, Yuri Kochiyama and her family. They really uh, were committed and walked the walk and talked the talk and did everything. Uh, and. It was a big influence on me and several of my friends from Toronto, and we brought it up. And eventually, she was brought to the Powell Street Festival. And again, people drew from that, drew strength from that. And uh, so you can see the commonalities coming together, influencing each other. Now, I'm not saying it's a widespread movement because there's a huge conservative element within the Asian Canadian communities in Toronto probably here too, I don't know for sure. But there was always resistance, always fighting <laughs> from between the two groups. And uh, I think that also served to link with the West Coast as well, because I'm sure the same sort of backlash was happening here as well. Jim? Um, in Vancouver, the, the Japanese were actually more together. Um, I think Tamio, uh, Tamio is Wakayama. Wakayama. Uh, he was a photographer and he had already been in the South, uh, with some of the black marches and so on. And he came up to, uh, Vancouver and he said, we need to do a book about, you know, uh, the whole Japanese cane experience. And so he set about in this project. I think it was like a centennial project or something like that. Yeah. And they gathered and made this incredibly beautiful book. And of course, an exhibition came out of it. And I mean, as Chinese Canadians, we were still, you know, just a bunch of belly acres more than anything else at that point. And we saw and we were astounded by what they had uncovered and what, what they actually put together. It was the most incredible. It was, it was groundbreaking. It was seminal. And it's, but also at the same time, um, I discovered this whole venue down in San Francisco and elsewhere. 
And I was there when um, there was the uh, I was there when they had the, the San Francisco State you know, student strike. I was there when they had the I Hotel. Uh, you know, they, they they actually fought the police to to preserve this old building uh, for for the uh, for the community. Uh, there were things that were happening. People were doing things, selfless things, that really mattered. Also. Uh, the universities, uh, UCLA and Berkeley and so on, were coming out with publications. And these publications were important. They were talking about identity, talking about themselves, and we would devour things like that. We would just bring them back to Vancouver and talk about it. And, and you know, and this is where all the kind of transformation takes place. And then, of course, you know, um, uh, we form, uh, you know, we formed the rudimentary of a, a writers group because uh, one of, uh, I think Paul, uh, actually it was Rick Xiaomi at the time, was commissioned to try to write a book about the Chinese community in Chinatown for Lorimer, which is an educational publisher, and he found he couldn't do it, so he handed it over to Paul. Paul's never written his life, but he you know, decided to take it on, and lo and behold, a book got published. And uh, from there, um, we said, well, you can get published. And then next thing, though, I think during that time was that we, 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 uh, we found out that Frank Chin has written plays. And one of the plays uh, came on the um, American theater in, on TV. It's called Year of the Dragon. And we were just astounded. There was Chinese Americans writing plays. I mean, it just opened up the, the possibilities that we can do much more. And so once uh, one of us got published, uh, many of us wanted to, you know, write our experiences and so on. So that's when the publishing movement began. And then out of there, uh, it kept growing. And then one year, uh, generally 1973, 74, all of a sudden from a group of maybe 20 people that we, that we knew around the country that knew each other that was writing, uh, there was this whole... Um, a whole group of inquiries, and they were coming out of the universities. And they were coming out of the English department or, or the creative writing department, and they were looking for us. And they wanted to join. And all of a sudden, we realized that we had like 60 or 70 people. And it no longer, you know, we can't just talk among each other. So we set about setting up an organization and setting up a, a, a newsletter. So that was the genesis for a lot of that kind of activism. Thanks very much. I mean, I wanted then to talk about how these workshops had then fostered certain types of genres. Certainly the, the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop has over the years, it has sponsored an emerging Asian Canadian writer and over the years it has certainly uh, helped with the, uh, the writing careers of uh, people like Madeline Tien and, and Rita Wong. Um, fiction writers and, and poets, respectively. Um, and uh, certainly we, we are in a period in which uh, we have poets using different kinds of multimedia forms, uh, moving into uh, digital forms, uh, mixing photography with, with poetry. Um, Terry, you yourself, uh, you record music, you're a historian, you're a poet, you're a novelist, you mix all these different kinds of, of genres. Um, as we try to, to, to progress into the future and encourage other kinds of experimentation with form, um, what kinds of new initiatives do you think can be undertaken with revitalized uh, writing and media uh, workshops um, as we are, are facing um, challenges of, of, of publishing in, in kind of traditional print formats um, with uh, new types of library acquisitions and, um, and, and as technology certainly influences the, the different forms in which people can uh, create uh, materials. I think what has to take place is the creation of opportunities to get your work out there, whether it is just the printed page or, as you say, all the different combinations of forms and whatever else. And I think um, the importance of the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop is the fact that it allows the writers in there to express themselves the way they want. You mentioned Joy Kogawa and Wayson Choi 
and others. Now, it's brilliant that they had so much success. The only problem with that is that publishers turn around and say, well, you're Japanese-Canadian, why don't you write about the internment? Well, I don't want to write about the internment. It's already been done. Okay, well then, see ya. <laughs> right? Or if you're Chinese-Canadian, why aren't you writing about the laundries, the Chinatowns in the 1930s and 40s? Well, I don't want to write about that. I want to write about the contemporary Chinese youth, Chinese-Canadian youth. And they said, well, okay, then find another publisher. So when you have the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop and you can advocate for these writers and push them and whether they want to do it a mix with film and uh, you know the, the internet and all these other things, it doesn't matter, right? As long as you can create these opportunities for these people to express themselves the way they want rather than at the, um, I mean, the whim of the publisher even though you know they are starving for new material and whatever else, they will come at you with this sort of stereotypical uh, uh, outlook on what they should be printing, what you should be writing, et cetera, et cetera. That's my two cents worth, by the way. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that that's, that's what we have to do. We have to advocate for these people, for the new writers and new forms. Jim? Well, the earliest group of us that published, um, Skyly, Disappear Moon Cafe, Wisdom Choi, um, you know, Denise Chong's book, many of these were confessional. And the earliest writings, I think the earliest writings that we all do somehow is confessional. We're writing about ourselves, we're writing about our past, trying to dig up and learn about what happened to us and, and, and writing about it. And it's fortunate in some way that these books first came out because it established a canon, but also it, um, it created such a strong and powerful uh, voice of what, uh, what we needed to know about ourselves. I think that was there at that time. But also what was happening with us was that when we first got published, we were the only ones. And... I, you, you're left a choice. You can either shut the door, close it, and just make a career for yourself, or you do something about it. And so many of us decide that we wanted to change that. And instead of, uh, of looking for opportunities, because when we got published, we were given opportunities, and there were serendipity. You know, these opportunities just came. And, and many of us uh, that got published, we won awards the first time. And it's surprising, you know, we still haven't found it, but, but we deliberately decided to change the equation. So the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop was set up to help young writers publish. We want to create a literature. And so for the last 20 years, that's what we were working so hard on, to actually to give as many writers the opportunity to publish. We learned the whole publishing game. We learned to almost act as an agent uh, we, we help, he, we help uh, writers through the contracts and, and you know, just give them all the tools they need. Because most writers, the most difficult thing is to get the first book out, uh, to get it to a publisher and, and so on. And we realized that we couldn't leave it by chance. So we had to make the effort for people. About 10 years ago, we created what we call the Emerging Writer Award. And at that time, there wasn't a lot of writers getting published, Asian writers getting published. And every season, there was a fall season, a spring season, we thought, and we would look, anticipate to see if there was an Asian writer at all. You know, and we'd cheer if there was one or maybe two. And so one of our directors said, Jim, at least let's try to make, at least try to guarantee one writer a year. So that's when we created the Emerging Writer Award. Emerging Writer Award is unique because it was a solution to a problem. It was not to give an award for somebody who published a book and that they're the best one to publish. We were using it as a vehicle to attract manuscripts. And so the best manuscript is the one that we choose. We give it a name, we give it the award, and help them get, uh, you know, get a jump start on their writing career. However, the other ones that are mature and reasonably good, we will work with them also to try to get them published. 
because our main aim is to get as many people published as possible. So sometimes you can't leave things a chance. You have to find a way to do that. And now we're in our 20th year. Next year is our 20th anniversary. And we are now looking at the second generation of writers. And this new generation already is completely different. Um, this upcoming literation festival that we're going to have, we're going to be featuring fantasy and science fiction writers. We're going to bring together a whole group of people that will be writing this genre that nobody's heard much about. And uh, they're, you know, some of them are very, very successful. There's a woman named Lorna Suzuki. Uh, she's uh, self-published a series. And the series is now has been bought by a film, uh, a film uh, company. And they are now... I think sometime next year or year after, they're going to start shooting this uh, film series. So um, now, you know, how do we describe writers? And it's the same thing. I I've said before, uh, I took a whole bunch of photographs, but then what makes me a photographer? Anyone can take a photograph. Anybody can be a writer. And that's why I keep saying to people, anybody can write. You know, but what makes you a writer? A writer is one that puts a lot more sweat equity you know, perseveres and tries to get her own book, his her own book published. That's what it makes you a writer. But the whole idea is that anybody can write. And we, we try to encourage people to, to, you know, take that on. And even this, in, in this new generation, 20 years after, we're still pioneering because there's a whole generation of new writers out there writing completely different things, you know, diverse in ideas and thoughts. And it's the very first time that you actually see the emergence of a, li a true literature that was not just confessional, not about the past, not about ourselves personally, but about things, about what we look at and how we see ourselves. So I think it's unique. Um, and, you know, and from here, we're going to have to transform it much further than that. And what we need to do is that we need to then encourage you know, this new generation of people to not just get involved with writing their own material, but to try to somehow give, you know, put themselves in the situation to help the rest of the community. Because if you look at it, 20 years ago, we had nothing. You know, it's not too far ago. And so, you know, we still got quite a bit of ways to go. And that's the work that we have to do. Earlier over lunch, we touched on the topic of how sometimes as an Asian Canadian community, we represented ourselves politically as united, that we have a kind of coherent politics. But certainly within community formations, there are arguments, debates, severe disagreements. And sometimes we need to open up those parts of, of history. And I, I know certainly in, in Jim, you, you've discussed then how the community is a very diverse community and, and Terry, I know that you've often dealt with parts of Japanese Canadian history that have sometimes been suppressed. So I, is, it, is it at the time now when we can more than ever look more honestly at these uh, community formations, not just the unified aspects, but also the disagreements and the conflicts? Well, that's an interesting question. I think of um, a particular, this, after redress, I won't go into the whole conflict of redress, but after redress, it's interesting that a lot of second generation Nisei started telling their stories. And they wanted to get it and put it in books, because this is what they're used to, and have it as a record for their children and children's children. And interestingly enough, one particular man decided to talk about his experience in Angler, which was a concentration camp in Ontario for Japanese Canadians. Actually, before that, it was prisoner of war, but eventually it was all dominated by Japanese Canadians. And these guys in there, because they were put into such a severe camp, turned around and said, we want Japan to win. In fact, Japan will win in six months. Of course, they were wrong, but it's interesting that in his book, in his manuscript in Japanese, he was pro-Japan, waving the flag, hated the Canadian government, 
and he talked about all these secret things. I mean, I had never heard of these things, the riots at the uh, immigration building in, uh, in Vancouver in, the 19, in 1942 at the uh, top of Burrard. I think it was Burrard. Um, anyway, it's, it, it's there in the book. And all these sit-down strikes in protest of the war. You never, never heard about the resistance movement. Uh, from anyone, and he put it all in this manuscript. Now, as it got translated, he got cold feet. And he said, I don't want it published. I don't want it out there. I want everything back. I'm going to rewrite it. And, of course, he did rewrite it. This time he's waving the Canadian flag and whatever else, and uh, we wanted Canada to win, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a reluctance, although they're willing to tell their story, they're reluctant to tell the true story. Now, it's interesting, too, that just before I came here, these a pair of sisters approached me and said, please help us uh, edit our father's manuscript and get it into print. Now, in his case, he actually told the truth about Angler. He was there as well. And he told all these you know, great stories about the the, uh, the hatred of Canada, and they they were willing to give up their citizenships. And he, the man's 95 now, but he wants it published. So maybe it is a time now that the differences the uh, you know are being set aside, and it's coming up because it wasn't there before. I tell you, there. <laughs> Uh, I went on a couple of internment camp tours, and it, like the floodgates were open, and they told me all these stories that you never hear about. You know, people sort of walking out into the wilderness to kill themselves, basically, because they were in the camp. Before that, it was all, well, we were all law-abiding law citizens, and there's nothing we could do about it anyway. So we just grinned and bared it, as it were, but all these other stories. So it, I suppose it means context, you know. If you have the right context, bang, they come out and tell you this story. Oh, yeah, uh, Robert Edo got arrested for you, you sneaking a camera into an internment camp, and then somebody else took the blame. I'll tell you later who Robert Edo is. But <laughs> anyway, that's, that's, that's my opinion yeah, I think Terry brought up a whole thing about um, struggle, as we call it those days, because community, community is a very loaded word. I mean, who is the community? That's what one person challenged me. Am I part of the community? I don't agree with you, so why am I part of your community? Community, we use all these kind of words those days. There's catchphrases. We use the word consciousness. And consciousness also refers to the fact that you're not conscious, you're not aware. So if you're conscious, it means something. You know, those kind of things were things that were going on in the community. In Chinatown, there are two Chinas. You know, it's Taiwan and People's Republic, and they constantly interfere with the local community. In fact, they stifle so much of the growth of it. You know, you're constantly struggling and fighting to just push things ahead. And the other thing I want to talk about is writers. The Asian Canadian Writers Workshop, people ask me, they said, why don't you bring them all together? I mean, you know, you should be one big family. I said, no, 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 no. Writing is a very solitary discipline. Also, a lot of writers are very competitive. You put them in the one room, they are, you, know, you find out they'll hate each other. You know, you won't find that a lot of people agree with each other. They'll form little cliques and they'll start working and, and so on. And you, you ferment so much problems that you don't even want to deal with. So we keep the writers apart. That's how we, we keep peace among each other. And that's the way life is, you know. Life is never pretty. And, but, you know, but somehow we kind of create a, a kind of template. We say, we don't ask a lot from you. If we help you, you get published, great. Pay it forward. Help somebody else. That's all we ask of you. So in some way, we're, that's what we're hoping that people do. You know, once you become famous, don't shut the door. But... You cannot, you cannot go away from it. You know, the whole artist community is very competitive. You know, there's a lot of backstabbing. There's a lot, a lot of uh, you know, jealousy and so on. And that's the way it is. We don't share. It's not a common thing that we share. And we talk about it in that kind of way. But you actually create the conditions for people to share. 
That's why we create, um, we, you know, two, uh, two years ago we created a literation a festival. And people don't get it. There was one writer, she was really upset with me uh, because I somehow forgot her in one of the emails and I left something out. And she got just really, really upset with it. And I kept trying to say to her, you know, I'm not inviting you because you're famous or because you're already established. You don't need us. The only reason I, I'm bringing you and other writers together is hopefully that you can inspire and help a new generation of younger writers. That's your purpose. That's why we bring you together. We're not bringing you together to have a party. And we will offer you as much as we can and the hospitality we can, but also, you know, our generosity wherever we can. But you're here to, with a mission. And the mission is what we want you to, to do. Some of the writers, they come, they get it. And that's what we hope to do. We want to change a generation of writers. And we want to change the way people behave towards each other. And, you know, but you have to understand it's not as simple as that. You know, people tend to live in their own little silos. They have their own lives. You know, reaching out sometimes, yeah. Uh, there was one, I think, Bing Tom used to say, you know, the only way you can get a group of people together is you create a crisis. You know, you can manufacture one, you can set a, a fire that's controlled, but as long as there, there's a danger, people will come together. But outside of that, probably they don't. And it's a very unusual phenomenon about people, how, how we, we learn about how, how we deal with communities. But yeah, there's a lot of, you know, like, it's not as simple. It's, it's been a lot of work to, you know, to get to a stage where we, we're in front of here, we can actually talk about it. But really, I, I'm really serious about this idea that we really got to transfer our knowledge about identity. Like, who were the first ones? How did uh, the spark of, of the Asian Canadian movement started? Where did the Asian American movement start? So you can get why these people are so hung up about it, why they spent the rest of their lives working on this. There's reasons what, uh, of what made it happen. One of the things that I, I saw recently was a, a film on Manzanar. It's one of the camps in the US. And apparently from film and from my recollections of it, people there were talking to their uh, parents and the parents always talk about camp. And they talk about camp in such a nostalgic kind of nice way that they, you know, they thought it was just simply like a picnic. And then of course, finally they had got a chance to go there and see and start reality of what that place meant. And once they had that, it transformed them. Every year they had another one. They had to keep bringing more and more people. And movement starts from there. It starts from something very powerful. And it's an uncurrent thing about injustice, about, about how you feel about yourself and how you gotta deal with your own identity. Thank you very much. There's actually just one last question I'd like to, to put to both of you and come full circle actually to the idea of memory and archives. And both of you who have now made major donations to special collections, as you have gone back then through the process of, of donating your, your collections and you've sifted through this material, what would be uh, perhaps one thing that stood out in your collection that perhaps surprised you as you went through that collection that in some ways triggered some kind of well, thought or perhaps even an angle of, of seeing that, that you hadn't thought of before, that actually the process of collecting this actually began to, to put things together in a, in, a, in a particular way for you. So, and, and, and turned you into kind of like the, the self-conscious archiver of, of your memories in some way. What was one, one maybe significant aspect of it that kind of stands out in that, in that process? Terry. Thanks. <laughs> well, I, I suppose there are so many, so many things that uh, inspired me, but I think one in particular was finding the book No No Boy. I don't know if you anyone knows about it. I mean, I know Jim does. Glenn knows about it. But it is a, <clears throat> it's a, a novel about a Japanese American who said no no to the U.S. government and was put into jail, and then comes back to the Seattle area, and <clears throat> it got me to thinking that. 
In this book is the essence of what it means to be Nisei. And that was it. What is it that makes Sansei, Yonsei, etc., Chinese Canadian as well, what makes them Chinese Canadian, Japanese um, Canadian, American? In No No Boy, it's there. And I've, I, I've seen it come up time and time again. For example, I told you about the James Shigeta movie in Crimson Kimono where he plays a Nisei detective in L.A., and this was made in 1960. <laughs> it's a Hollywood movie. It's amazing. And he actually gets the woman, a white woman. And the last shot is of James and this woman kissing in the middle of the Nisei, Nisei Week Parade in Los Angeles. Now, the essence of that, I mean, that, apart from that, is that James Shigeta played this Nisei guy trying to find out what it meant to be Nisei in America in the 1960s, just after the Korean War. And he struggles with it. I don't, I don't agree with what he came up with or what the director thought, director writer thought, but at least he's searching for it. And I've seen it in other book, books as well. Joy Kogawa's book, Obasan, she, to say this, but I, I felt betrayed by it because I always, if you read, as I read the book, it came closer and closer to what it meant to be Nisei, and then suddenly she's in Hiroshima. And that I felt cheated. I really did. And uh, I told her that. <laughs> she says, well, you know, that's the way it is, Terry. <laughs> Thank you, Joy. But uh, No No Boy inspired me to look for things like this in everything, in the posters, as I mentioned before, the films, the, the books, everything. Oh boy, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'll tell you two things. One, one was an incident um, where we were doing a, a festival precursor to the Asian heritage event called Go For Broke. And somebody gave us um, an opportunity to put together a festival. It grew, out of, grew, grew way out of control. Uh, but into there, um, Terry Jang, who passed away, um, was a, 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 he was in theater and films. And he said, well, we've got to do, we've got to do a lot more on, on, on creating new theater and so on. But out of there, uh, we evolved a group called CANPAR, which is Asian Canadian, you know, ACPAR, I think so, Asian Canadian um, uh, Performing Arts Resource. And this group would have been going on, go, you know, full, full guns blazing now, except that Terry passed away. And it never really got to the full potential. But, you know, sometimes it's just one person driving it, and that creates the whole movement. You know, somebody, and it's not charisma or anything. It's just simply somebody that has a dog at will and somebody that can inspire other people. Uh, the other thing is that... Um, this photo exhibition that I recently put together. I mean, I, I took a lot of pictures of community events and there was a few, uh, uh, some protests and so on. And I just happened to be there, so I just snapped away like anybody else. And then I suppressed it for 30 years. And it was only until we put together the exhibition that I realized how important those photos were. And it surprised me because I didn't realize that, although during that time that I thought was really um, a vital time in my life, and also I was documenting what I thought was the vitality of a community. I didn't realize that the community was under siege and that people were out there to try to dis you know, disrupt and destroy it completely. Um, and then once I understand the history behind it, I realized why. You know, because the remnants from the Second World War, up to the Second World War, the Chinese weren't even allowed to own land outside of Chinatown. Then into the uh, late 50s and 60s, they were trying to expropriate the whole area and kick everybody out. But the people that were doing that were the remnants in the city hall, in the politics, were the remnants of that racist group of people that were still around and didn't think that the Chinese would resist. And it's because the Chinese community came up and resisted that we 
man should preserve our dignity and actually have, you know, have much of Chinatown you know, saved. But, you know, it's things like that, um, things that you never thought about. But, yeah, there are, there are many things that surprised me. But it made me take another look, a hard look, and a, lar a hard look at the perspective of what was going on at that time. So now, after 30 years, I can actually write it with, some more, with much more clarity than I could have done in the past. I'd like to thank Terry and Jim for generously sharing these important histories and their reflections on their personal archives as well. But at this moment, I'd like to open up the floor to, to questions and uh, comments from the, uh, the members of our audience here today. Uh, so uh, please, if you have anybody here who would like to uh, raise question or, or make a comment. Thank you. Uh, do I have to sound? Okay. Um, as a Torontonian Vancouverite hybrid, a young activist and a professional archivist, this was very uh, interesting for me, so thank you very much for um, sharing your comments. But the one question I have um, is a little bit broader, I think, and uh, I want to know, as individuals deeply embedded in the Asian Canadian communities, um, I'm wondering if you can speak from your point of views on the future of Asian Canadian communities, uh, what you hope to see, and perhaps what you expect from the younger and newer generations. Why am I first all the time? <laughs> well, I'd like to see a, a common consciousness amongst Asian Canadian groups. And like they have done in the United States. I mean, I would like to see it grow stronger and tighter between the groups. And that would be a really good future, I think. And, uh, and also to recognize that the Asian Canadian groups are growing all the time with immigration coming in and uh, the backlash to that by the established communities in Canada. What can be done to counter that and also how what can be done to help these Asian Canadian new Asian Canadians coming in and making the transition or if they don't even want to you know how is that going to evolve that would be an interesting uh, look at these new communities flourishing across the country Um, one, one thing that I know about um, being in Canada is that can Canadian government and uh, Canadian society will allow you to do whatever you want. You can say wherever you want, you can go anywhere you want, you can eat wherever you want, but they won't do anything for you. If you want something really bad, you have to do it yourself. And that is so important, because if you want to change society, you have to somehow find a way to do it. And there's no other way. And that's what we've been doing all along. We didn't like the reality that we saw, and we, want, we sought to change it. And by doing so, we reshaped the whole uh, Canadian literary scene. Now you can go to the library, and there's actually an Asian Canadian um, literary section. That wasn't there 20 years ago. You have to create your own reality. And so I think that that's the kind of things that, um, that we have to see in the future. We have to, you have to also think of yourself as a pioneer. Everything that we do is new. You're going to be covering new ground. What we don't want you to do is not cover the ground that we cover already. But there are ways for people to connect and find common ground. Um, we have now a generation of people teaching each other you know, you have Asian Canadian writing courses. There's also something in the horizon that's very, very important. Because there was a Chinese uh, apology from the uh, provincial government, um, what has happened from there is that the community spoke out loudly and said, we want to uh, have change in curriculum. Because unless the public education system has the history and talks about ourselves, there's no way we can learn about it. And uh, Chrissy Clark has stood up in, in the legislature and said, yes, we will do that. 
However, just because she said it doesn't mean it's going to get done. There's a lot of resistance. The whole education ministry doesn't like change. They'll resist you. So there's still a lot of work to be done. I mean, uh, for the future that I like to see in the next three, five years is that uh, curriculum changes and Asian Canadian uh, minority history. And, you know, you can actually go there in, in you know, in uh, K to 12 and actually learn about yourself. So curriculum uh, education is very, very important because most of the kids that are coming out of school really don't have much knowledge about their past. And that's really why, the, why there's so much problems, why it's so hard for us to work with in the community. It's only during the time that you're in the universities that you actually have a chance to open yourself up and learn about this. But, you know, you're, you're in the minority. We've got to change it and we've got to re-educate the, uh, the entire society. And so that's work that's incumbent on people like me, you, and anybody else. You have to be conscious of it, and you have to go out and be aware of it. You've got to find every opportunity to support and change it. And, you know, you guys are, you know, you guys have an educational faculty. You guys are into all this other stuff. People create curriculum. Well, that's where we're going to have to start looking into and start pushing. And I would just add, add briefly that I agree with Jim that we need to sustain this work and can never take human rights in a democracy for granted. That, that we, it's not uh, actually something that exists on its own, but through the conscious efforts of, of people to be willing to participate in a democracy. And I think that uh, the, the defense of, of rights uh, the uh, the criticism of um, certain types of inequities uh, always must be uh, something that, that requires a lot of vigilance. Uh, another question? Thank you, Sue. Hi, uh, my name is Sue, and um, my work has been focusing on a lot of like, intersections between um, different racialized groups. And uh, the past few days, I've been thinking about the question of anti-blackness and how as um, Asian Canadian, or I'm not an actual Asian, but as um, a racialized subject, how do we articulate or address other forms of racism or colonial violence that's not directly um, pointed to uh, an Asian person or uh, Asian identified uh, group of people? And how do we articulate that? Solidarity, uh, either through our individual work or activist work, scholarly work, or creative work. Thank you. All right, so you're asking how Asian Canadian communities can help other. I think help is a really loaded verb, but. Um, how do we uh, show our support, but without taking up too much space, right? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think in the Japanese-Canadian community, there is the political group, the um, National Association of Japanese Canadians, and they do um, lend their support. They don't take charge, but they will lend their support. They will send letters of support, of protest, if you will, uh, for various groups. And uh, this does fly in the face of the conservatism that I talked about before, who would never get involved. I mean, I remember running or helping to run the uh, Earth Spirit Festival, which was a collaboration between the Japanese Canadian community and the Native Canadian community in Toronto in the early 90s. And I swear to God, <laughs> I mean, I, I really applaud the NAJC for getting involved in that and setting up, you know, lending a hand, get, uh, I wrote my first play for it, I did music for them, and all sorts of other Japanese Canadians got involved, but it was supporting them. But that other conservative group just said, well, it's Native Canadians, we're not getting involved, they're just a bunch of drunks. You know, and so it would take the, our, the NAJC and other, you know, uh, participating groups to tell those people you should be ashamed of yourself. You know, you're stereotyping. 
who the hell do you think you are? Remember when you were the enemy of the people in 1942? Constantly reminding people of where they came from and supporting other groups in their fights, if it is a just cause. That's my answer. Yeah, I also helped start um, a group called Asian Heritage Month here. And basically, Asian Heritage Month, I think if you look at it, it's, you know, the concept is, well, we're going to um, use this group to explain to the mainstream community who we are and so on. But no, no, no. We start off with our own communities. The Asian communities, first of all, they got to see if they even like each other. And whether or not they care enough about each other, they want to join together and do and share things. So we found certain commonalities. We found that there's a lot of old world politics, a lot of old world, old world uh, hatreds. If you start putting them into you know, into play, nothing happens. You know. So what we found was that we were using arts and culture, because music, for instance, we share the music. A lot of the instruments that uh, that are used in Japan, China, and elsewhere originally came from uh, the Middle East. So there's a commonality in the music. There's all commonality in words and expressions. So we use that as a common place to create a common ground for people to gather together. But recently, now that I have time, I, I've, been, you know, I've uh, become more of an advisor. I start looking at the problem. Because why is Asian heritage, after 18 years, is still predominantly the, the old groups? the Chinese, Japanese, and the South Asian, because they've been here the longest. Why? Then I realized something, and it took a little while, and this is one of these things that you, you, you never think about, but you did. From 1923 to 1947, there was an immigration rule called the Chinese Immigration Act, which we call the Exclusion Act. Between 1923 to 1947, almost no Chinese entered the country. Okay. What it didn't say to you was that there was also something else implied. If you look at it closely, no other Asian groups arrived either. Although it didn't say that there's no other Asian groups excluded, most of the groups that you find, the Vietnamese, the, uh, the Koreans, uh, many of these Southeast Asian groups, most of them came after 1949. So they began the community at the, uh, the earliest 1950 and onwards. So they have been only here for 50 years. Think about it. You know, you're only here for 50 years, it's still a new community. That's why these young uh, communities are so young. They're still, in the first generation, they're still in survival mode. The Korean community actually talks about their second generation as 1.5 generation, because they're still in the evolving stage. You know, it's gonna take them another 20, 30 years before the third generation will arrive. The ones that are completely Canadianized. So what I did then is I actually created a new uh, program it's called First Family, First Stories. Because what we want to do is go back to these communities. We have a unique time to actually go and find these uh, family, the first original families that came to Vancouver or Canada and document them. But for the first time, we're going to document their history as they arrive. And what have they done since they arrived, the 50 years? And many of these communities, done, they've done remarkable things. The Vietnamese community has an Olympic wrestler that won gold medals. You know, each community has done some remarkable things since that time. But they have to, we have to help them begin to document and, and come and recognize a history that starts from the point that they arrive in Canada, a Canadian history. Only until they actually have that history and can actually see it and actually can touch and taste it, then you can see that that transformation will happen. Because right now, most of our community is still back in the old world. You know, most of them still reading old, you know, old newspapers. So, but that's things that we're working on to try to change. We have a question here from Chris Lee. I'm going to speak to my contrarian question. So I'm going to preface that by saying I, I really appreciated your long-term, both of you, the work that you put in building Asian Canadian communities and also your dedication and commitment to working in the educational field around this, because this is really important. I'm going to say this because I'm going to ask a, a contrarian question, which is that it seems to me that the context for talking about Asian Canadian identity and culture here uh, assumes a sort of immigrant and integration kind of mode. And, and because we're talking about generations of settlement, right? And so certain groups are here longer. I mean, 
we're, for a lot of Vietnamese people, we're talking about a refugee migration for some, you know, which is not a same kind of, you know, uh, immigration pattern as, say, Chinese, Canadian, Japanese, Canadians. We're talking about also a emerging Asian Canadian communities that are here because of guest worker programs, you know, that are legally problematic for all sorts of reasons, right? And so, I, the question I would have is, um, could we argue that Asian Canadian, in fact, doesn't allow us to recognize this kind of diversity because we assume certain kinds of patterns of behavior. So, you know, in, in response to Sue's question, and I'm thinking about Terry's response, what happens when Asians are in fact uh, oppressing other groups? They're not just in solidarity with other groups, but in fact Asians are complicit in the oppression of other groups, right? What, when, you, when it's not simply the Asian that's being oppressed. Or what, what happens when we have globalized subjects, as many of our students, who aren't necessarily thinking of in settling in Canada. You know, this Canada might be one step along an international circuit, right? People are going back and forth. Um, and I, so I guess on one hand I'm asking, is Asian Canadian big enough to envelop all these sorts of stories without trying to kind of move us toward the settlement question? Or is there a moment when we have to say maybe Asian Canadian isn't the right story anymore, or Asian Canadian isn't the right narrative anymore? So this is meant to be provocative. I'm asking you to think about the limits of this, you know, rich history that you're outlining for us. I refuse to answer that question. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. Um, <clears throat> I think the term Asian Canadian is, if you will, big enough to um, encompass all that. And I, 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 I go back to No No Boy again. There's a key line in there that the, the writer John Okada says that. Uh, it's an example of the oppressed oppressing the oppressed when uh, African-American uh, teenagers basically uh, brutalize him. And uh, I think on that level, you know, there is a recognition that there is a continuum, an evolving, uh, I mean, I couple that with uh, Banana Boys, which was not about the immigrant uh, experience. It, it's about going to college, right, or university, sorry, America, they call it college, but in Canada, these fellas in their 20s go to, was it Waterloo, I think? Waterloo, yeah. And we, we see their experiences, and that certainly isn't immigrant experience, but it's embraced by the Asian Canadian community. I mean, not entirely, but because they don't know about it, but segments of it. And, like, I've heard certain generations of them say, well, I'm tired about the Chinatown stories. I'm tired about the Korean church stories. I want something that reflects me. And I think it's wonderful. I think it should evolve like that. I think it should bring in other groups and uh, experiences. Jim? No, I think the word Asian Canadian has to be all-encompassing. If there's a concept that isn't all-encompassing, then you failed. It's very important that it does. But um, the way that I look at it is that, like, it, you know, you have to see it as an overseas diasporic experience. You know, uh, the new immigrants that arrive here are no different from the immigrants that came in the past or in other places. The first generation is into survival, and they, are, they have already made certain decisions and certain sacrifices to come here. And so for them, all they need is propagate the species and also make sure that they have the you know, desired education and the knowledge to be able to, to deal with it in the second generation and third. But by the third generation, they're going to have the same problem over again because that generation is going to be English-speaking mainly and probably have never gone back to the homeland. And so that identity thing happens all over again. You just have to be patient. You know, the, you know, the, the, now right now we're talking about the PRC, you know, mostly people from China, and they don't care right now. And, in fact, I excuse them more than anything else because the Cultural Revolution wiped out all the culture and history. And many of these people are probably even more vacant than we are. But the problem is that their children and their children's children are going to have the same identity problems because by that generation, they're just like us. 
you know, they're going through the same thing. So I have no problem looking at that. And yes, I understand that the immigrants don't see the way we do. And there is a lot of uh, old world rivalries and, uh, and things fought on all sorts of grounds. You know, but even among ourselves, we don't agree to everything. Um, just because we're community workers or we do things or activists, we fight among ourselves. You know, there's never a, a total harmony, but there is a direction and there is possibly a change for the better. And that's what we look for, a better tomorrow. And that's the only thing we're going to hope for. I think that if there are any other questions or comments, I, that, that would be actually a very nice spot, I think, actually, to, to close off our discussion, that this uh, image here of not perfect harmony, um, something that doesn't have closure, but is in, in process, a work in progress, but actually with a shared series of, of goals, something that isn't entirely unitary, but is actually in flux. So I, this has been a, a, a really insightful, productive discussion today. And I, I, I thank Terry and I, I thank Jim again for uh, generously contributing to this, this particular discussion in the ongoing formation of this important area, Asian Canadian studies. Thank you once again from the Dodson Room at the University of British Columbia. Thank you.